All right, there we go. Um, well, for anybody who's watching, welcome back to another episode in this series on deconstruction. I'm really excited to have uh, Mark Harris here with me on this episode. Uh, Mark, it will introduce himself here in a second, but he's a, a pastor, licensed therapist, um, and an author that I've come across over the last couple months. Um, I've mentioned him multiple times if you've been watching any videos in my series so far. Um, he said a lot of things that have resonated with me and, and just concepts that I've brought up through this series. Um, actually, one of his concepts is, is the splinters idea that I brought up in this series. And, and these videos are actually the various splinters that have been a part of, of the journey. Um, so, Mark, um, if you would just kind of introduce yourself and um, talk a little bit about uh, your story, maybe just as much as you'd like to say, and what made you interested to write on this, and just so everybody kind of understands how you relate to this this topic. Mm -hmm. Well, Russ, thanks for having me, and it's uh, great to be here. Looking forward to the discussion. Well, like you said, I'm a therapist, um, author, um, musician. Yeah, just uh, really passionate about this subject, the um, religious refugees, you know, those on the, quote, deconstruction, reconstruction journey, those who are experiencing a faith shift, whatever word you want to call it, that's this wild cataclysmic breakage of the past um, to the present to the future uh, when it comes to faith and spirituality and understanding of God and life and church and the sacred text I think one of the reasons why I'm so interested in it I think it's probably twofold one because I've lived it uh, I've gone through the journey myself and I think it's important to differentiate. I mean, there's people who change beliefs, you know, at times, but this is a pretty significant shift for, for us who just, it really is this deep disorientation where it's not something we choose. It's literally something that happens to us where we wake up and we have these sort of splinters, these things in our mind that we, we can't, we can't forget about. We, we can for a while, and that's where cognitive dissonance comes into play. But at some point, we're just like, I cannot authentically believe that, whatever that splinter is, whatever that thought, that doctrine, that belief is. And for me, it just unraveled as somebody who was in the church for, well, for a while, come from a very wild background, a lot of drugs and mental illness and violence and and uh, you know family death. My mother died from a drug overdose, and that whole experiences have certainly shaped my understanding of life too. But I'm just I'm just really passionate about it as well as a therapist who works with people who experience this. And at the time of the writing, there was just a few books. Because I said to myself, where's a book on helping those who are deconstructing their faith? <clears throat> there was a few. Um, of course, you, one can point to Brian McLaren right. um, or Kathy Escobar's book, Face Shift, which was great. Uh, Marlene Winnell. But I think mine was, you know, I tried to combine, you know, theology, philosophy, psychology, and I... Um, yeah, it was just a, a burning call, if you will. I just really wanted to help people. At, at this point, since the writing, man, there's probably 10 to 15 books on this topic because uh, mm -hmm. it's sort of the end thing. But I think that's just a, a little bit about me, and I'm just really passionate about helping people <clears throat> heal from toxic religion. It's just when you have different eyes to see, the different nuances – of some of the toxicity of certain Christian and even beyond Christian religious principles, practices and policies and persons. Um, you start to say, man, this something needs to change. So it's coming from a deep place within myself. 
Yeah. So you obviously had your own deconstruction journey and, you know, that was informed by, I mean, in your book, Religious Refugees, you talk about your own story. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's actually the book where that concept of splinters came from, for me anyhow. Mm -hmm. Um, So, um, yeah, well, great. Well, I'm really excited to to go through this and toward the end, um, I'll let, I'll let you kind of plug yourself or let everybody know where people can find you. Um, and I'm going to put some links down below for people to find, especially that book. Um, so they can dig into it. Um, but yeah, so, so we can go ahead and hop in. Yeah. Um, so just to kind of give a little introduction for the topic and then we'll go over some questions. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, questioning the sinfulness and depravity as it's called of humanity at the level at which it's purported in a lot of Christian circles was a huge splinter for me. Mm. Um, I remember, I remember thinking about John Calvin and his concept of total depravity. And I found, I find it curious that he had to come up with this idea of common grace to explain why people weren't as bad as total depravity said they actually were Mm -hmm. right. There had to be another explanation to backtrack his theology and actually make it work. That's what common grace is. Mm -hmm. Like somehow God is restraining men from being as bad as he can be, but we're totally depraved. So these are the splinters that started forming because I'm like, yeah, I mean, there's evil in the world, there's pain and suffering, but I'm just not really able to buy into this idea of how sinful, you know, the, the, as, as, you know, it's called worm theology, you know, we're, we're just worms that deserve to be burned. Mm-hmm. Um, and I started having issues with that. Um, so in my own journey, seeing myself and seeing humanity in a different light than that has been a big part of my growth. It's been a big part of the peace I experience now, what's encouraged me to continue deconstructing um, how I treat people Mm. um, and just ultimate, my ultimate healing um, on, on this path. So uh, I'll give kind of a background on um, what I learned as far as fundamentalism is concerned. Everybody kind of has their own journey in this, but in my experience, Um, there's this ongoing, uh, or there's, there's this underlying ontology of like perpetual decay. Um, and it all aligns with original sin, total depravity, eternal hell. It, it, it comes as a package. And so the paradigm informs a low view of self and others. And a lot of Western evangelicalism, as far as I can see, really holds to these views. It's it's very popular in in the Christian sphere. So essentially, it goes like this. God created the world perfectly six to 10,000 years ago. Adam and Eve were tricked by a serpent, ate some fruit off a tree. Second law of thermodynamics was thrust into motion. Everything started falling apart and continued to do so until the end the new heavens, the new earth, when God burns this current earth and creates something new. Um, and so the, the point of bringing this up is that the now, what we live in now is it's undermined. It, it's so bad. And humans are so corrupt that true spirituality is found in constantly looking forward to an eternal perspective, as they would call it. Um, not only are we, we worms, but the world that we live in is so spiritually destitute that it's awaiting its fiery destruction. And so this just informs so much in the perspective, any, any opposing view that finds too much beauty and joy in the present reality is seen as loving the world. Um, it's in danger of being swept away by the evil of this age. And so there's a lot of fear and negativity that's projected on the current existence in this perspective. Um, So my argument and and what I really want to discuss is how deeply these perspectives inform and influence our experience um, in in the world that that we live in. Um, And and I, 
I want to make the case that they have a truly negative influence on our psyche, how we view ourselves, um, and, and how we view the world in general. Um, in this view of perpetual decay of humanity, um, I want to ask the question, are we shooting ourselves in the foot? Like, is, is this really working? Is this negatively affecting our relationships with self, with others? Is it causing us to miss a lot of the beauty of this life that we get? Um, and if we do find um, that these views are destructive, are these the views God wants us to have? Um, it is, it is, is that what God wants for us? Mm. So in the same vein, what if this life in this world is God's end goal, right? That's a different perspective than mm. much of Christianity teaches. You know, what, what if we're viewing pain, suffering, and brokenness in the wrong light as something that needs to be removed instead of something that keeps the universe balanced and, and in flowing order? So that's mm. a long introduction, but I just wanted to set the stage for something you talk about in your book, Religious Refugees, um, called The Ontology of Spatial Energetic Potentiality, or OSEP for short. Um, and it sounds confusing, but I think when you explain it, it's going to make a lot of sense in this topic. So can you give a simple explanation of what this is, um, how it contrasts with this, what I'm calling ontology of decay, um, and, and the correlated <clears throat> doctrine of what you call original sinful hellbound people? Sure. Um, I guess it would be important to uh, to state that I'm not a physicist or a evolutionary biologist or cosmologist, and I'm fully convinced they would be able to <laughs> kind of talk about these things in a much more nuanced uh, fashion. So, but you know, I take a shot. Imperfect human being on journey, and so for me, the ontology of spatial energetic potentiality or OSEP. Or we can even get beyond the name because it is um, a little potentially confusing. But for me, it it refers to uh, a constant movement and change and fluidity of all energy and matter. Like it encompasses sort of the divinely co-created spaces located within the fabric of all reality that allows for potential events to occur, right? So it opens up the possibility of growth and decay and movement and, you know, our human experiences of joy and despair, safety, threat, connection, uh, and disconnection to occur. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the sense that we are constantly being propelled forward towards something. And so experiences of connection and beauty, joy, suffering, they never last because life or let's say evolutionary processes to put it in that uh, simple understanding is that we are constantly being thrust towards new moment of experience. Like each moment is a new moment. And I think of sort of people who were uh, at one point drawing, you know, stick figures on caves to human beings, you know, flying to the moon, you know, some things that, back then people pointed to and maybe thought was some sort of, you know, God or something like mm -hmm. we're there's movement. There's these processes that are just expanding and unfolding. So a world without OSEP um, would be a non-existent one to me. I mean, it would be, it just, I can't even see how that would be possible. So for me, there was never a moment where there was this perfect sinless perfection where nothing ever evolved. Uh, I mean, really, was there a, uh, never a changing state of uh, blissful perfection without the hint of evolving processes, uh, without the interdependency of decay or chaos or novelty or growth or life and death, really? Like, that that actually doesn't logically make sense to me. Like but You mean, mean like pre-Adam and Eve? Yeah, like... like like Adam and Eve, they, they didn't have a belly button. Like like plants never died uh, before Adam and Eve sinned. Tigers like, didn't attack like antelope. I know, like it's so wild. And I was actually thinking today, I'm like, if there never was a fall and nothing ever died, 
he, like earth would be uninhabitable. <laughs> like things would have grown so far out of proportion. Uh, like, you know, the species just constantly, you know, growing. And I mean, it, right. I, I just can't see how on earth like that could actually even exist. So for me, that changes the theological game. You know, mm -hmm. there never was a state of sinless perfection where chaos, death, and evolutionary processes were absent. So we don't have to view humans as originally without sin, which is pretty wild and weird and probably it could be new for people. Like, what are you even talking? How is that even? Po Mark, have you seen the state of our existence right now? Yeah. But I, I just don't see how that could have occurred. Uh, where humans were originally without sin, who became prideful, then guilty sinners, and then godlike beings who defied God and left a pure utopic perfection that doesn't make any sense to me anymore. Um, so logically, it doesn't make sense. And then, yes, I have to question. Now, I, I'm able to maybe put original sin in a different context. Right. Right. So let's say that we can view ourselves as it's actually instead of like, it's almost like an adventurous, courageous view of human beings who through the ripple of time, uh, who I remember writing courageously fluttered and splashed and then crawled and clawed and slowly evolved into complex sentient beings who through the moment to moment guidance and creative empowerment of a loving God began to know what it means to be sort of godlike. So right. maybe original sin, I think there were two, one or two hominids where, you know, God in God's divine lore said, hey, this is a better way. And the moment where we had these sentient minds or a level of consciousness where we could say, F you, God, uh, I want to be my animal like self. Maybe we can, you know, throw original right. sin in there somehow, you know. But that's just some thoughts I have about it. You know, it's well, it's interesting. You mentioned quantum physics earlier, and that's been a huge rabbit trail for me on this whole topic. Really mm. fun to go down. Um, but one of the funnest things I've discovered in that space, and I actually I interviewed a couple videos ago, a guy named Johan and Rotz, mm. um, who's done a lot of work. He's a physicist. He's done a lot of work on um, what's called idealism, which is the view that consciousness is fundamental um mm -hmm. and that our connection to the divine is much more direct than we were led to believe mm -hmm. um with the big chasm and fundamentalism like he's god and you're not right um there's this sense of the deepening of our being made in the image of god that we couldn't even have consciousness if it wasn't source if it wasn't his um, or her, hers or hers. No, I'm just kidding. Thanks. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. Or hers or right, right, source right. or whatever you want to call it. Groundable right? being, whatever word you want to give to, right? Yeah. The divine essence. Whatever. Yeah. It doesn't care <laughs> what you call it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think that's like, that is such an um, anathema mm. to think that there is a God likeness in us. We couldn't be conscious if that weren't true. Where does consciousness come from? It has to come from a source. Consciousness can't come from um, matter. It's impossible. You have the hard problem of consciousness. So consciousness has to be the starting point. And so what you start to see, and again, I'm not a physicist either, right, but just right. recounting all this, it's interesting to think about all you're talking about and seeing life through that perspective that life is literally God experiencing the world through us in a more progressive way throughout time. Mm -hmm. And that's like, that's a beautiful thing. Then you start to see death very differently. Mm -hmm. um, death might be the end of my ego and your ego, right? But we're just one expression of this divine dance, essentially, that's going on is what I've been processing lately. Um, sure. Yeah. So mm -hmm. anyway, just the thought yeah. on, on kind of what you're saying there. It makes me think of panentheism you know there's mm -hmm. a difference pantheism and panentheism and right i mean nothing could exist without god uh, you know it's sort of taking the christian scriptures literally in the sense of 
you know, in God, we have, we live and move and have our being, mm -hmm. right? That the only way we could exist is if we were a part of source. Now there's a difference. Pantheism says, you know, all that exists is God. Right. And so, you know, do wrestle with maybe a panentheistic perspective where we are in God and perhaps God on some level transcends that which we are and that which matter right. is in some, in some level. Yeah, I mean, we're fragments of it. I mean, we're small parts, right? Like mm -hmm. we're, um, I've heard it equated to like, we're altars of God's cosmic big consciousness. Yeah. So pan panentheism allows us to exist in him, but be separate from him. Um, but but it's still just very different than the, the big oh, wall, the dividing wall that we oh. experience in fundamentalism. Yeah, it's a game changer for me. Once I realize that spirit is ubiquitous, is everywhere, I don't care what you call yourself, what religion you are a part of, you are in God, and God on some level is working in your life, through your life, with your life. Right. And that was, I mean, the, the lure towards the sacredness of all things, where there is no dualistic, you know, natural, spiritual where truly everything is very deeply spiritual. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, where as before, you, you know, they would maybe point to if you have not the spirit of Christ, you're not of his. And that we are completely separate in that we're the only ones with the spirit of Christ. They don't. And to the point where they, you know, are hearing, listening to demons, you know, or, God has no part in them because they're so sinful, you know? Right. And so I could only have this us and them mentality. I can only say, oh, wow, they don't have God. And like, I was doing weird, stupid things. I was like, I, I, you know, and I have a lot of compassion upon that self, but I was putting like, God, I plead the blood on the doorway as I go into my college class and who who's a Christian and who's not. And maybe they're worshiping the devil and I'm, it's like such a fear based, you know, everything is so scary and uh, terrible. It's a terrible way to live. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting too, because it all correlates. I mean, once you, once you accept evolution, it, it changes so much because your view of existence and reality and just, how long things have been around you have to accept death has been around for a long time Since but you also have to accept that consciousness yeah. is progressive and it's mm -hmm. expanding and you know this is kind of an, a stupid elementary thought but i remember when i was processing eternal conscious torment mm. i was thinking of an analogy of like god is much more conscious and aware than we are and wiser right um at least if that's the view that you have of, of him her whatever um and i started thinking of myself with lower forms of life like could i imagine myself burning a dog for billions of years for killing another dog it would just be the stupidest it doesn't even make mm -hmm. sense mm -hmm. and it, it's interesting when you start looking at um like ethics that exist in lower life forms that progress more nuance with humans, obviously, but there's just so much more connectivity to life mm -hmm. and all the, all, all the things stop making sense. All these black and white boxes stop making sense. And it's like the, it's like believing the earth went around the sun. Like when is the evangelical community going to catch up to this stuff? Like when are they going to stop? saying oh well that scientist just hates god therefore all of his assumptions are based on trying to disprove god and and building those black and white boxes it's really a disservice to discovery it sure is mm -hmm. and it's one of the main reasons why people are leaving the uh, institutional church in droves mm -hmm. well from your perspective as a as a therapist how do you think 
uh, bad ontologies like this influence mm. our view of ourself and our view of others? What is the effect that you that you see? Yeah, I think ontologies and anthropologies, they just really matter. I mean, what we believe about ourselves, our fellow human beings, our fellow creatures can either move us towards connection and, and flourishing, or it can move us towards greater disconnection and chaos. So I think if we perceive that humans are primarily bad, it would cause us to maybe be suspect of all those around us. Like, as I was saying before, you know, um, saints, sinners, in Christ, not in Christ. In Christ, good. People who don't have Christ, bad. That's why they need to be saved. Who am I going to trust more? Uh, those who claim to be Christian in and out, us and them. So I think it also reinforces our tribal instincts. Mm. Um and then, obviously, I think it would perpetuate shame and shame addiction cycles, which propel us towards more maladaptive behaviors that harm us and those around us. So I, I'm not a big fan of original, sinful, hell-bound people. I think what we believe about human beings matter. And what if we believe that, you know, just as I, I think I've shared in the book, it just as light and matter can paradoxically display properties of both waves and particles, that human beings can be both paradoxically saints and sinners. So we all have the capacity to sin. We all have the capacity to be saintly. And then perhaps if I think that God interacted with two hominids in a very special way, that breathing new life or in the sense of some interesting Imago Dei-ish experience into us that at certain points that we are primarily good. Um, it gets, I'm still th thinking through this, right? Because I'm very wary of throwing a metaphysical claim out there. And that's probably the allure towards sort of a, a, a Christian humanistic framework that's just very weary of throwing out no, at the core, you're good, only good. I lean towards that, right? but I also know, so just from experience alone, that we can do both good and not good. But at the core, I do want to believe that we're good, if only it is a, it's the better story. But I can also take a faith claim and say, if there is a God, perhaps there is something more beautiful than there is ugliness within the human uh, spirit that um, right. yeah so it's all important like i would not tell my son your heart is desperately wicked above all things i mean hell to the no uh, so i i want to speak life i want to say no you you're good even if you don't do good your identity is one who is good. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it fits my intuitions, but I could also take a, a risk and say there's some metaphysical ontology there that uh, there's something within us that genuinely is ontologically good. Right, but that seems to align with progressive consciousness because, I mean, go back to the dinosaurs. They were just, you know, ripping each other apart, you know, and there's a there's a progress of, you know, morality that's progressed over time, right? I mean, there's a in, in a more primal sense, even the Bible talks about unreasoning animals, mm -hmm. like in our consciousness growing beyond that, like not acting according to like our animalistic impulses. The that's flesh. something unique. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you unique to humanity. Um that in principle speaks to the fact that we find more fulfillment and more growth and more progress mm -hmm. on the other side of those things. And mm -hmm. I think it's interesting because in this world of deconstruction, the accusation is constantly that, well, you just want to go sin. You're just deconstruction. You're just deconstructing because you want to go backwards, but there's no nuance or space for the fact, well, no, actually I'm progressing forward. I have more desire than I ever did before mm -hmm. to not be an unreasoning animal and actually have, you know, more consciousness and, and awareness. 
<laughs> you see that too? totally. Yeah, I mean, certainly, I, there's. Uh, I think it's just a false view and understanding of what it means to be on this DR journey, uh, or what I call nowadays. I'm trying to get away from deconstruction, just sort of a spiritual metamorphosis. But we, you know, we don't choose it, you know. But I would say most of the people that I've ever met on this spiritual metamorphosis, they're just much more freer and more free to love, more free to love themselves, more free to love them, love others, which is so wild where you think religion at its best would offer a path to a greater sense of what it means to be human. And unfortunately, that's just not the case. That actually there's a mm. constriction, there's a narrowing, there's a bondage producing element to much of religion. And it's very, very uh, deeply sad. But mm. I, so I don't think we're choosing it. And uh, we're not uh, hanging out with Satan and, hey, let's sow our wild oats and do our own thing and screw everyone and let's just eat, drink and marry, be married before tomorrow we die. Right. I've never met anybody like that on this journey. Right. <laughs> yeah. So Yeah, it's just yeah. projection. It's just scary for the people in those circles because they, they associate safety and certainty with the tribe that they're in. And when you walk away, they've got to throw rocks at you to make themselves feel better about staying in the circle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's all kinds of motivations. Yeah, whether some that could be even jealous, you know, there's a, this yeah. interesting element, envious of, I wish I could do that, but uh, I'm working in this church and that's yeah. my only source of income. Um, I don't think it's at a conscious level so much. Sometimes it is. But yeah, that's all kinds of other things is... Um, it's a complete threat to, and to the fragmentation of the self. You're challenging my beliefs and my beliefs that I'm so fused with where I find my identity. That's a scary thing. Like you're, you're not just questioning beliefs. You're questioning my whole world, my whole identity, what this whole thing is built. I've lit. Well, actually I've said this before. If the Bible wasn't true, I might as well kill myself. That's that literally, I mean, that's what I believe. But mm -hmm. that same sentiment I found with other people too. If the Bible can't be trusted, what is the point of living? Like, how do we trust anything in life? So it's, it, you're right. It's a very scary, you know, proposition to even suggest this Christian tradition is not true, you know? Yeah, I think too, for us, on like going through deconstruction, one of the most powerful things is seeing those things in ourselves in the past. Mm -hmm. um, at least for me, it's been like, it, it's naming those fears. I remember, mm -hmm. like, for example, I remember when I used to listen to atheists, I was afraid to listen to them. I was afraid to hear their point of view because what if I'm convinced? And, and you know, right, there's just so much fear associated with that. And so I empathize with, with people in those circles, but also seeing, seeing their projection for what it is at a deeper level only causes me to continue to deconstruct because it's just an affirmation of the exact behavior that's led me to be on this other side. Mm -hmm. um, that, that there's, you know, there's further trails to trek um, and a lot more exciting things to, to get into. Um, and that's really what I wanted to tease out with you is just this idea of like almost beauty in, in the chaos. Like you, you can't have one thing, but not have another, you can't have, and this is, this is what stood out to me about your whole OSEP concept. Mm -hmm. Um, because before I ever read your book, this was a huge thing that I was processing and letting myself see was that, we don't get to experience pain or reward or, or we don't get to experience pleasure or reward without the pain. Like you, you can't have one without the other. And you, so you just think about these ideas of in eternity with no suffering, no sickness, no sorrow, 
like no sorrow, like sorrow is a good emotion to have sometimes. Right. So it's like, we demonize all these things and, and just come up with something that's completely untenable in reality. Would we really want to live in a world like that? Right. Um, so, yeah, I, I, well, I guess we wouldn't know any different. I mean, you know, if you think, uh, if it was a, you know, this, this world where there was no sin, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just trying to think from that perspective, maybe there could be a, you know, it, it just would, it would be a reality. There's all kinds of realities that, that get normalized and, but it does, it does beg the question how that could be any real form of existence to not have the, the beauty of, of pain uh, to learn or growth or, you know, right. the, the beauty of the, the loving embrace where somebody you haven't seen in a while. And I don't know, it, it's all, it's all a, the package deal, but maybe there could be this place that's just, man, everything is tiptoeing on the tulips and flying unicorns and, you know, joy juice. And I don't know, I guess philosophically yeah. is possible. But you know how when you get your back scratched, it feels good for like 30 minutes and then it stops feeling good? <laughs> right, right. Like you have to go back to a baseline, <laughs> right? And like, it, it's like, it just doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense. But I think it's connected to what we were talking about. I think pain, pain is, people are so afraid of pain in a lot of those circles. They're so afraid of um, so afraid of death and, and have to have clear explanations to these harder questions. And I think that's a lot of what it is. It's just mm -hmm. having to assign meaning to more complex things. Um, mm -hmm. so that, so that at least that's what I've experienced and looking at my old self, that's what I was doing. Sure. Um, and now coming to a place where I'm like, Hey, I don't know exactly what happens when I die. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm first off, I'm admitting that, but second off, I'm okay with that. Um, yeah. and God is too, because nobody else knows, like <laughs> nobody else has any clear, concise description. I know. Right. But, but those circles, mm. there's like this psychological effect in these circles that, Oh, you have to know. And if, if you don't know, you don't believe. And if you don't believe you're out. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yep. Uh, you know, John gives us a perfect vision of what the heavenly reality will be. Really? A perfect, clear vision? Really? Um, but right, it's like you're just supposed to say, yes, I believe in the afterlife. I believe in heaven. It's real. Its streets will be paved with gold. That, like, But listen, I haven't been there. Maybe it's, there's some epistemological humility and just saying, I, I don't know. I hope there's something more beautiful and grander than what I'm experiencing now. And certainly there's, you know, there's people who have reported. Uh, that's an interesting field in itself. People reporting something on the other side. Uh, yeah, I mean, people writing books on it, but talking about the different corridors of hell, you know, and heaven. I'm not sure I buy any of that, but right. there's been a lot of interesting reports of people, though, you know, dying, coming back to life and this whole light thing and sort of blissful oneness that they experience. But I haven't been there. I don't know. Can't tell you. Yeah. I just think the concept of all this with the ego is so interesting. Our ego wants to believe that it's going to exist forever. In, in its present state and like just as who, we, and maybe it does, like maybe there's a way where it does and there's some literal interpretation to things that Jesus said, but what if it doesn't? Mm -hmm. What if our consciousness reintegrates with source consciousness and expresses itself in a different way for millions of years on end? And, you know, yeah. I mean, there's, there's different ways to look at it, oh, but totally. you're, mm -hmm. but you're just not, you're not allowed to do that 
yeah. in those spaces. So I have this question for you. Mm -hmm. As a therapist, how has how has working with people directly influenced your view of deconstruction? Because you have a little bit of a unique, I'm, I'm sure you've worked with people who are deconstructing, oh, right? Yeah. All the time. So like having kind of a bigger sample size than someone like me has, how, how has that informed like your perspective of the whole thing? Oh boy. Um, I think it's just, I mean, I would say, I guess in a vague way, it has helped me with different lenses to view those on the deconstruction journey. I think one of the biggest takeaways is just the real beautiful compassion I have for those who are going through it and taking their subjective experiences seriously, providing a place where there's unconditional positive regard and love and just being congruent. Uh, it's also given me a lens, you know, obviously of compassion, but for both sides of the coin, you know, I have a lot of compassion for those who have not deconstructed for those who are people deconstructing against, you know, it's not talked about a lot, but there is this odd symbiotic relationship between those of us, we're so hungering for truth in the right way, in the right path, and those who are willing to give it. You know, those who are in positions of power, who they like, and there's some writings about this too, but so those who are in power feel really good when they can have those who are underneath learning and growing from them. And But we, we're like, yeah, feed me. Oh, this is great. It, so we feel good. They feel good. It's not very much talked about, but it's also a different perspective due to, to see a lot of the deconstructing grief is also because fantasy and projection and displacements where maybe we didn't have the best, you know, early childhood experiences. We're longing for family. We're longing for, you know, um, consistency and truth and, so we're, we're like, oh, give it to me, church. So it's this weird, interesting, you know, I could see all these different nuances of, of both sides. And so I, I'd say it just gives me a broader perspective and, uh, you know, an increase in compassion on so many levels, this whole thing. That's reminded me of in your book where you talk about that symbiotic relationship between the... Um, the lay people that want a narcissistic leader <laughs> um, and the leader that needs the followers. Yeah. Like, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and I've talked about this even before I was fully deconstructed, but the mm. link between childhood trauma and what we allow to happen in the church, because they're mm. so closely correlated um, just the dynamics of that, yeah, that yeah. relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a lot of the grief, and I'm not saying it's all, you know, we're just simply, you know, grieving or, or the lack which we experience in our family of origin. But a lot of it, too, it's so mixed that I don't think people realize, wow, it's grief because my church let me down and they were telling me things that weren't true as if they were true. And I'm also grieving life and the fact there's death and there's COVID and you know, my, I had trauma in my early childhood experience. Like, you know, I had a bad breakup. But somehow I, I do think it, it then, for some people, it gets funneled. And the church becomes a scapegoat for all the ills and the pain and the grief that the people experience. Now, this isn't, people don't like to talk about this. But um, that's just what I see. And it's not to diminish people's experiences because obviously I'm, I'm a therapist. But I could see different layers uh, underneath. And um, yeah. You know, because people feel like, well, no, I want, I want to believe that the church is the sole, sole origin of all my problems. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, yeah, I'm just not under that persuasion. 
even though at one point in time in my DR journey, I was like at the church and they are the problem and that's pastor this. And I remember visiting churches. I was such an asshole. I was, man, I remember cursing or just being like a total jerk to people just to, I mean, I had a, I, well, actually in my book, I call this the station of angstville <laughs> where, you know, anger and skepticism and that kind of energy is, is a part of the course in that sort of station and journey. But I, yeah, I was there. How long, how long would you say you've been on the deconstruction journey at this point? Yeah, I, I was wrestling with that because I don't know if I should say I'm off the train. Because I want to relegate that journey to such a period of time where it's so disorienting. Um as opposed to like if another if you ask me in another way, Mark, are you still wrestling and questioning? And yeah. But like I almost want to relegate the DR journey for those where it's affecting them deeply on an emotional level and they're disoriented and you know, they're in there's grief and there's anger and their pain and they're walking on feel like they're walking on a waterbed rather than solid ground. Actually, I think I point to the fact that I, I might be on station eight, which is, yeah, I mean, I'm at a place where I'm not that. I, I'm not like, oh, my God, what do I believe? Right. Um, there's no there's no fear anymore. I'm not really concerned that deeply about. So I almost want to say I'm not on it to value so highly the season of life that some people are in that I don't want to take away from that in, in a sense. So Right. Well, let me um, ask it yeah. a different way. Yeah. How yeah. how long ago was that time frame you would consider yourself in angstville? Yeah, I would wow. Probably a good couple of years. Yeah. 2 okay. or 3 years. It was uh that was a yeah, I remember that experience. <laughs> yeah. See, my problem is in this deconstruction journey, and this is more, um, I'm really into like personalities and Jungian functions and, and all that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm naturally a thinking personality. And so my thinking function is way ahead of my emotions. And so usually what happens is my head will figure it out. Like with deconstruction, I'll start seeing the missing patterns like this doesn't make sense. This isn't working. And so my identity is tied to my logic, but then my emotions like, wait a second, where the hell are you going? Like you, like you haven't worked through any of this emotionally. And so I have these huge emotional tidal waves of like, where am I, where am I going? Like logically this makes sense, but my emotions don't know what the hell is going on. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so I come at it like trying to be like very like, amicable like let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. there's still value in the church and a lot of times i'll undermine my emotions in that process and then they'll kind of come swinging out and then i've got a process i think that's the angst that you're talking about yeah and and you yeah that's where you alluded to you know there's a, a model of therapy called internal family systems so we have different parts of us you know sometimes we'll have the the logical, you know, rational part online. And then it's not really in touch with the other part is like, man, I'm still really hurting. Like F that pastor. Like I still remember what he told me and it, yeah. And gosh, I really, I'm destined to hell. And he gave such a vivid portrayal of what that looks like. And I, so there's different parts of us, you know, or the part that's still grieving the loss of community. Um, yeah, and still there's phantom theologies, you know. Right. Yeah, you know, it's like a limb that's cut off. It's I haven't believed that in a long time, but I just had a nightmare about going to hell last night. Exactly. <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's an interesting, just observing my own internal dialogue between my thinking and feeling brain is very fascinating in this time. 
um, it's, it's a big cluster, honestly. I mean, it's yeah. not a clean, it's not a clean journey. Um, yeah. some days you don't even know where you are. Um, and I always overestimate my ability to work through things quickly. It's like I overcommit myself logically to what I can't handle emotionally. And so I've, I've learned that through the process, if I can respect my emotions more on the front end and slow down a little bit that, you know, it, it's a little bit easier to process and less overwhelming. That's exactly um, why I spend a full chapter on emotions in the book. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. That which we can name, we can tame. And there's something really beautiful about knowing our, you know, this is the task of integration. You know, how does the left brain dance well with the right brain or the different parts of us dance together? Mm -hmm. That's this, this feeling felt sense of, of integration. Yeah. Well, one of the things I appreciate about you in religious refugees is you walking that tightrope of honoring deconstruction, right? Which a lot of fundamentalists, they have no idea how to do. Um, but then also, you know, you're still a pastor, right? I mean, you're, you talk about Jesus. No, you're not a pastor anymore. Uh, well, I guess it's how you look at it. I'm not a pastor working in a church. I have, certainly have a pastoral heart. I'm an okay. ordained pastor. Um, but the, I think the days of working in a church might uh, not be around, you know, anytime soon. So, okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's fair. I mean, I, I guess what I was trying to say is um, you definitely haven't thrown out everything with Christianity. I still, in your work, there's mm -hmm. a still a big respect for the person of Christ. Yeah, There's still yeah. a big respect for the scripture. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when I got to that part of your book, which is more toward the end where you start talking more about reconstruction, I got uncomfortable um, <laughs> because I was like, where is this going? Like, <laughs> right. is he going to try to get me to reconstruct in a certain way? Right, you know? totally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and it was fine. It was fine. It, it spoke to me in a way because... Um, I remember going through and doing one of the exercises you talk about in that book of thinking about a projection, a picture of God mm. and sitting with that for five minutes. Mm -hmm. So you get to that neuron in your brain and you sit there. Yep. Yeah. And then you, you can kind of split that and create a new memory there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is your baseline for association mm -hmm. um, with, with God um, and I remember doing that exercise and just thinking, I haven't prayed in six months and I haven't known how. Mm -hmm. um, and just how much that was connected mm -hmm. to who I thought God was. Yeah. Right. And I just, I was on a plane when I did that exercise and I just started crying and um, I prayed again. And it was really short. Yeah. I just mm -hmm. was like, I was just like, God, I don't know you. I don't, I don't know a lot, but I'm, you know, I miss connecting with you. Wow. And, and that was pretty much it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that was really powerful. And I, I just say that because I appreciate the accountability that you have in that book to go work through that, yeah. um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's, I guess it is those later stages that you're talking about, but I still find a lot of solace in Jesus. I haven't been able to let go of him. And uh, it's funny because I, I interviewed Phil Drysdale. He's been doing a lot of research on how many people deconstruct and become atheists. It's very small. Mm -hmm. It's like he's finding it's like 10 to 15 percent. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the rest of people still maintain some sort of spirituality. I just think that's fascinating because that's not that's not what Christians say that's not, it, it's just, it's black and white. It's apostatizing. It's walking away from the faith. And yet yeah. we're walking away, trying to dig further into who God is in a sense. And there are many ways in which 
I look at what Jesus did and I feel like I would be closer to him now than I ever was before. If he mm. were walking this earth, I feel like I, I could have a better conversation with him now. Mm -hmm. Um, even though I don't know exactly where I stand. Um, yeah. but I, I just appreciate your, your, the tension that you hold there. Can you talk a little bit about mm -hmm. that? Just kind of your perspective on that. Yeah. I appreciate that you appreciate that. Um, <laughs> not everybody can, and for good reason, uh, because I tried to provide a space in the book where I think if anyone's read it, they've never said this is what you should believe. I always have a lot of room, and I usually specify, like, this is where I'm at. And so you have your own journey. And some people find that my book is a little too uh, spiritual. So then I just recommend them to Marlene Winnell's Leaving the Fold, who wants nothing to do with religion or spirituality. And that may be more beneficial. But yeah, I try to yeah, just have this middle space of <clears throat> not being a fundamentalist, but still appreciation for Jesus. And I'm also very cognizant of the fact that you know, our conceptions of Jesus are very diverse and our minds, which are our filters that are conditioned by a great number of factors like early childhood experiences, geographical locations, etc. We can never perfectly conceptualize who Jesus was. So if my version of Jesus is different than yours and we could have 10 people in a room, you know, we could say Jesus is, if we ask like what the main metaphor is, some might say, oh, Jesus is king. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is lover. Uh, you know, Jesus is liberator. Right. So even our conceptions of Jesus are very different. But yes, I, I wanted to, I'm all for spirituality. I wanted to portray that in the book. There's some good research on the, you know, spirituality being very healthy. And I did not just want to throw it all out and say, hey, this is where I'm still at. And I invite you to be congruent, even to the point of if you're on this spiritual metaphor, metamorphosis and you feel you want to be an atheist, by all means. I mean, you, at the end of the day, uh, you know, I've reminded of Bronnie where the palliative nurse worked with those who are dying. And she wrote the book, Five Top Regrets of the Dying. And she, one of the, top five regrets is I wish I lived a life that was true to myself and not a life that others um, told me I should live, you know, it's that yeah. kind of sentiment. So yeah, I want people to be congruent and follow their path wherever it leads. Hopefully it doesn't lead to hurting people, but <laughs> right. I, I, I'm not, I'm not a, Oh, all paths are great. They all lead to God. If you want to eat people and engage in cannibalism, by all means. Right. So I, I have my opinions, but at the end of the day, I'm nobody's God and you need to follow your own path. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's, that's a, a hard thing to come to, you know, when you've come out of a, a paradigm of, beliefs being so tied to morality mm -hmm. um if you don't believe this you're wrong if you don't believe this in this way you're in danger so many people told me i was in danger and if i kept going down this path my heart would be hardened beyond repair oh yeah all the worst and, possible fears mm -hmm. and it's just it's fear base mm -hmm. um so um, we've already talked about consciousness being expansive and growing, and that's kind of one of the principles behind OSEP and that whole idea. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a contrast between a lot of Christianity, which just has this like destructive perspective of existence that all is bad in the world. Mm -hmm. Um that we, that I kind of alluded to, but then what I've come to more recently is much more constructive. Um, it's viewing things in a more positive, much more positive light. 
Um, and this is a very new age idea that's a no-no in a lot of Christianity. Um, but all, a lot of the new age stuff that I've discovered has interestingly <laughs> aligned with quantum <laughs> physics mm -hmm. so perfectly. It's not even funny. Right. Um, and, and the thing about my personality is I have to like, things have to be logical and grounded. So mm -hmm. I would have never looked at new age and been like, Oh, this is the shit. <laughs> right, right. But because I started with quantum physics and like that wet my appetite, mm -hmm. I was like listening to new age people talk about like source and energy and consciousness and vibrations. And I was like, they're, they're talking about science. How do they know this intuitively? Mm -hmm. Like, how are they coming up with these same conclusions? And they had no knowledge of, the, like the quantum physics research or anything. It's just fascinating how many yeah. people are starting to see the, the convergence of those two things. But that's why I was open to these new age concepts. And they, they just, in many ways, you know, they're not perfect, but mm -hmm. there, there's ways that they describe God that are so powerful, um, especially when it comes to our relationship with him, our relationships with self relationships with others. Um, and, and it's really, it's fascinating how evangelicalism just sees this as a no-no, um, but it, it just aligns so much more with what you're talking about in this flow state where mm -hmm. God is creating more and more opportunities for us to experience him at a deeper level because the whole new age conception is consciousness, it's awareness, it's growth, um, uh, it's collective growth of humanity. Mm -hmm. You know, think about where we were thousands of years ago, as you said, there, there's, you can't debate that there's a collective growth. Um, and, and just as kind of, I don't want to go too far off on this rabbit trail, but there's a book called Dominion written by a guy named Tom Holland. He's an agnostic, but he writes about the influence that the person of Jesus had on Western thought. Mm -hmm. Um and so it's fascinating to just look at, it, it's really hard to argue with the fact that humanity hasn't improved in some sense mm -hmm. like that, that we haven't. And now Christianity will come in and say, no, things are getting worse and worse because they see things in that six to $10,000 or six to 10,000 view um, of, of the earth. Um, but once you get past that, this idea of growth and flow and consciousness and expansion um, to me, it just lends itself to a much deeper appreciation of God. And it's funny because on this side, I remember, I remember struggling so much with doubts about God's existence as a Christian. And it's funny because now I, I have like being completely authentic and not having to say anything right. I have no doubt of God's existence. Mm -hmm. Like on this side of things, it's, it's fascinating. I, I don't have any doubts. Um, now the essence, the essence of it is different. Sure. Sure. Um, but I, I don't, I just don't see without that spiritual element, nothing makes sense. Mm -hmm. Nothing makes sense. Um, is, is this what you see as well as, as you look at it? There's a bunch of thoughts and I'll have to kind of wrap up as, help put my kid to sleep here okay, sure um i am i part of me says yes and part of me says i'm not sure okay uh, i think there's no doubt that we are evolving our consciousness is, is evolving in some ways certainly collectively i think stephen pinkner wrote a book and on you know the the essence of you know humanity sort of evolving too and growing in empathy and so I, I have no doubt that we are growing and expanding i guess i part of me says though i'm not sh sure i have to think about it whether it invites us into a greater depth of relationship with god hmm. i i only because i want to i want to honor I, I think part of the reason why i say that is i want to honor the simplicity of thought about God that some ancient, you know, uh, you know, mothers and fathers of the faith 
like like the mystics, uh, the psalmists, right? Like, I don't know what level of consciousness they had, but for a psalmist to, first of all, there was something different about them and maybe what the other priests and other other you know Israelites had an understanding of God. I think it was different, and they had such a depth to them. Like for the psalmist to write. I, I know that Psalm 103, you know, bless uh, uh, the Lord, praise the Lord, my soul, all my innermost being, praise his holy name, uh, forget not all his benefits and who forgives all your sins and who heals all your diseases and redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Like, right. dude, that's freaking deep. And there could be a lot of people in our society with, I have a higher level of consciousness and understanding of God but they don't have that, right? right? And so I, I just want to, I say yes, and in some ways, I, I don't think we need to have, I don't know, I'm wrestling through it, but uh, yeah. I think we can be simple-minded and have an incredible depth uh, with with the mysterious slash known slash unknown God, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. and And I'm definitely not saying that it's, and maybe it's the words I'm using. I'm not saying mm. consciousness just revolves to like logical understanding or intense depth of understanding. Mm -hmm. um, I'm more thinking of it in general terms, I think. Of just collectively, there seems to be a forward progress with humanity um, where, you know, at some point, like, meta consciousness had to evolve where we had the ability to observe our own thoughts right um but think about think about i don't know a thousand years ago like think about a you know an ancient indian tribe or something man they're like one with nature they're they're in a you know very spiritual very communal that's true i see what you're saying you know yeah. so i just and then I can't help but think of Western capitalistic, individualistic, you know, mm. very sick. <laughs> Let's eat the ice cream all day and watch reality right. TV shows. And but yet we're very spiritual. And I don't know. I just wonder there's something to me that's very beautiful about some of our, you know, ancient uh, and even possibly current. You know, like take a tribe somewhere who doesn't have all this knowledge and consciousness that we have but so simple and so loving and communal and connected mm, yeah so that's something to work yeah through. yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah well i know you got to run any um any final thoughts or anything else based russ on what talked about? i have a final thought it's been beautiful yeah cool. good being with you good uh, love the dialogue i haven't wrestled i haven't done a podcast in a bit so it actually feels good to wrestle a little bit Mm -hmm. cool well i hope we can do it again sometime i'd really like that okay. um but how how can people find you well speaking of ancients i'm a dinosaur when it comes to uh, social media so not on instagram not on tiktok <laughs> i i think face, f facebook is the <laughs> everyone tells me man you gotta get a tiktok account get an instagram but i think just facebook you know, you have a website. Think. I think you have a website, right? Uh, MarkGregoryCaris.com. And you have uh, a YouTube. You make music. Uh, sure. Mm -hmm. You can throw a link on there. <laughs> there's some good short. There's some good short um, counseling clips on there that I saw too. Oh, that's some right. Great, mm -hmm. some great insights. So I'll put all that in the description. But Sounds most good. of all, just thanks for the conversation. I, I highly yeah. encourage everybody listening to, if you're deconstructing, um, definitely check out religious refugees, especially if you came from the Christian camp. Yeah. Um, I think you'll really appreciate the balance of that. Um, and and just the, I, I love the choice of topics that you choose in that book. You really cover a lot of ground. Um, and yeah, a, and so a pretty th 300 pages. Yeah, in a clean um, way. Just, thanks, Russ. And just um, another plug there, if people are ever wondered what the hell's up with prayer, and particularly petitionary prayer, 
is it effective? Does it work? Is it BS? Does it just make the person who's praying you feel better? How does God get involved with all that? My second book um, would be apropos for, for that uh, conversation. Mm -hmm. Divine okay. Echoes, Reconciling Prayer with the Uncontrolling Love of God. Okay. Well, I'll put all that in the description so people can click right to it and uh, I'll let you run. I know you got to cool. go. So thanks, Mark. Yeah. Russ, good being with you. Thank you, man. We'll talk soon. Okay. Sounds good. Bye. Peace.